I cheer up my friends whenever they're down is I normally try to change the subject because sometimes it's just hard for people to talk about it. And then I normally like say like a joke to make them laughing um, or, or at least smiling. I will hug them. Play for them. Hey, you're doing a really good job. Like if we're probably at school, then I could ask, do you want to play with me? Give them a hug. Well, make sure that the problem isn't too bad and that I don't ruin it even more. So I, I, if they, they don't want to talk about it, I usually just want to leave them alone. But I also don't want to make it worse by doing bad. Good job. Hug him. Doing something actually really funny. Well, I ask how I can be a good friend to them and make sure that I don't cause or make the problem worse than what it already is. And I want to make sure that they can, it, that it isn't like a really serious problem and that they can really be able to make sure they, they can be able to get over it. Um, you're really good at coloring. It's okay, let me play with you. Tell them that they're doing a great job. And I really want to make sure it isn't like something that happened long ago, but it's still in their heads and it's really bad. So I need to make, and I really want to make sure that they don't get like seriously hurt by it. Good job. See. <laughs> You know it's going to be a good service when we get to hear from our kids, right? It is going to be awesome. Lots of good things to encourage one another. And so that's what we're talking all about. And I love what June said up there. She said, I'll just tell them, you're good at coloring. So do me a favor, whoever you're around, if you're around somebody joining us online, just turn to your neighbor and tell them you're really good at coloring. Really good at it. Good job, everyone. Very well done. How many of the rest of you want to talk to Anna like I do? Because she had an answer to everything. <laughs> Laurie's, you're doing good work there, my friends. Hey, welcome. Welcome back to Crossbridge. So glad to have you here, no matter if you're here in-house joining us in Peru or online. Thank you so much for being a part of us as we gather today to worship the Lord. This is a big weekend. This is a Crossbridge Summer Bash weekend. For those of you who are in the house, hope that you are as excited as I am to come and be a part of it. For those of you joining us online, you may be in a faraway place. You may need to pack your bags right now, get in the car so you don't miss it. But regardless if you're far away or here, I pray that you're making plans to make it. We're going to have some of those same kiddos having fun with activities, bounce houses, students ministry, student ministry for all you teens. If you don't want to hang out with all the old folks like us, you'll have a space for yourselves to hang out. And as well, we're going to have some fun games and activities for the adults. Someone has to knock Pastor Harold off his perch for his uh, cornhole championship over here. So I'm praying and believing in each and every one of you. But it is going to be a great time, well worth the time that you would come to be a part of it. So I hope and pray that what I just shared with you compels you to come and be a part of it because it's our way of setting the environment to help you experience what we've been talking about this past summer, that life is better together. You and I have been created not to be isolated, to do life on our own, but to do life with others, that God has created for you for community, and it doesn't mean it's easier, but it's better when you do life with others. Now, I did just share that with you. I said, you should come. It's going to be fun. It's going to be worth your time. But I know for some of you, you may be silently thinking, will it though? Will it be worth my time? Will it be fun? Am I going to be as excited? Because Keith, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for you, but you know, you say that a lot. You are a pretty excitable fellow. You're pretty passionate. As a matter of fact, Keith, sometimes you're over the top. Maybe you should get checked to see if you're okay. Um, maybe you've silently wondered that. Maybe just to not make it so personal, how many of you have ever heard someone tell you something and you wondered if it was actually true? Come on. Yeah, maybe someone says, it'll only be five minutes. <laughs> really? Or someone said, the opera's different now. It's totally fun. Let's go together. We'll have an unforgettable evening. Will it though? Or someone said to you, it's just a really quick fishing trip. Is it? <laughs> it's interesting. Sometimes when people tell us things, there may be this something I call a little bit of a, a bout with doubt. You ever had a bout with doubt before? Maybe it's simple. 
When you're watching a program or you're talking with a friend and you heard something advertised and you wondered, maybe, just maybe, is this actually true? Maybe you've wondered, is that politician really going to do what he said he would do? Maybe you wondered, did your kids really clean their rooms like they promised you they did? Maybe you've silently wondered, will this stain removal really remove with the same power that it advertises? Or will this plant-based product taste like meat just like they say it would? The reality is, whether it's on an infomercial or in a conversation, most of us have had the experience of being bamboozled, tricked, having the old wool pulled over our eyes, been lied to. It's interesting when you think about it. Just for a moment, lies can do some serious damage to your relationships with God and others, can't they? If you think about it just for a moment, there are some serious things that take place when you've been lied to. And so we're filled and live in a world where there is dishonesty all around us. It's impacted a lot of us in lots of different ways. And for some of us, it started with doubt, but that doubt kind of morphed into something else. Maybe doubt morphed into cynicism or bitterness, or anger. Maybe you've even found yourself saying things like, why do I even try? It's always going to be the same. People are all the same. And I'm not even going to date anymore. I'm not even going to try anymore. I'm not even going to come to church anymore. Because we live with such dishonesty all around us, it could do some serious damage to our lives. That's why God, through his word, calls us, his people, to live different, to be different, that in a world filled with fabrications and fish stories and bold-faced lies and exaggerations, God, through his word, says, as my people, be people of integrity and truth. Be people of honesty. That's why today, as we're looking at all the one another's of God's word, things he calls us to be, ways he calls us to live, together we're going to talk about, together we keep it real. <laughs> together we keep it real. And I want us to see where this comes from. However you're reading God's message, would you turn with me to the book of Colossians? Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. A really powerful passage from God's word today that speaks to a community of Christ followers much like us today. And there's a really powerful invitation for us to keep it real together. However you're taking notes, I pray you've got your Crossbridge app or you grabbed one of those message sheets from the chair in front of you. Don't miss the word God has for you today. Grab your Bible, your device, follow along the screen. But would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word from Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. This is what God's message says to you and to me. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and it is speaking right here and right now. You you declare that your word is alive and active. It cuts through any junk that gets in the way and speaks right to our hearts. And so I pray that you won't find any of us putting up any barriers to the work that you desire to do in us. Lord Jesus, I believe there's a transformation that's taking place as your word is spoken and as you, Holy Spirit, flow through this place to every single person joining online and in our campuses and right here in the house. So you will just find an openness for each and every one of us that we desire to hear, to receive, and do what you've called for us to do. We're filled with hearts of expectancy and anticipation, Lord Jesus. As we say almost every week, may none of us leave or log off the same as when we came in, but know that we've encountered the living God in our midst. We believe you for it all, Jesus, and we ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you here would admit that you have been lied to before? How many of you would say that you have lied before? For those of you not raising your hand, congratulations, you got your first one, okay? (laughs) Uh, Just for fun, let's turn to our neighbor and tell him the biggest lie you've ever... No, we better not do that. He might get in trouble. The reality is we've all lied and we've all been lied to. It's the sad state of life. And again, as I said a moment ago, we live in a very dishonest world, so dishonest at times, that studies have been done, grants have been given, researchers have looked into this problem of dishonesty in our world and how bad it actually is. 
Just a few years ago, some researchers from the University of Massachusetts did a study. They wanted to see how dishonest are we. And they found out that in an average person, in a 10-minute conversation, a regular person will lie three times. It makes you think about your conversation you just had, doesn't it? (laughs) If you had a 10-minute conversation, maybe in your mind you're going, well, which one of those things was a lie? (laughs) I thought about that, and they even went a little further in this study from the University of Massachusetts, and they said, well, when do people begin to lie? And they found out that most people begin lying at age two or three years old. Are you serious? Our sweet little babies? I'm sure it's not our kids. It's all the other kids, right? Our kids are those sweet little kids that would never tell a lie, I said jokingly. The reality is each and every one of us know what it's like to even have those nearest and dearest, those the youngest to us, say something that isn't always true, to be dishonest with us. It's a legitimate problem. And because we live in a world that's filled with so much dishonesty, from the earliest ages of our life, we try to do what we can to discern truth in the midst of the lies, don't we? And so even as kids, we begin coming up with systems to start to work in our conversations to know, how do I know that I really can trust you? How do I know that the words that you are saying are actually true? And so even as kids, we develop this little thing to say, if you really mean it, and I want you to prove it to me. And it usually starts when we're a kid with a little something like this, doesn't it? What do I got here? Pinky. And what do you do if you're as a kid and you want to know, or you tell me the truth, and what are you going to ask him? Do you pinky promise? Oh, whoa. This is getting serious now. Because I'm not just talking. I'm pinky promising that thing. And man, as a kid, that was a big deal. But as you grew up a little bit, you found out that maybe it wasn't as big of a deal as you thought because you broke a promise and it was just a pinky promise anyways. And so there's not like a lot of accountability to this, is there? Now you lose a pinky if you break a promise. Now we're getting somewhere, right? I mean, you see someone with no pinkies, not to be trusted, right? (laughs) I'm just kidding. I was just kidding. That was one kind of starter problem because we live in such a dishonest world. But there was the coup de grace, the creme de la creme of promises. If you wanted to make sure as a kid that someone was being honest, you had this phrase that you would say. You would look at that friend, that kid, that neighbor and say, do you really mean it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Do you cross your and hope to? And then what? Stick a needle in your eye. That's when it got real serious. Now, again, as a kid, I love how we process it together. Cross your heart, hope to die, and then after die, stick a needle in your eye. That just goes to show you how terrifying of a prospect sticking a needle in your eye is that we would even put it after death. (laughs) It's interesting, isn't it, the things that we say? And why would we come up with stuff like this? Because we know even as kids what it's like to be lied to, to have promises broken, and the damage that it can do in our relationships. As adults, we've already chuckled about it a little bit, right? (laughs) Pinky promises, cross my heart, hope to die. But adults, you know we do the same thing, right? We just come up with fancier terms. We call them contracts (laughs) and guarantees. (laughs) And we have harsher penalties if you break them. All because we live in a dishonest world. And for most of us, we know that there is something that happens in dishonesty. Dishonesty, it strangles the life out of us, out of our relationships, Almost every single week, I have conversations with someone as a pastor, and their conversations are centered around a breaking breaking of trust, a promise that was made but that was taken away. And there's so many conversations, conversations such as a gentleman comes into my office and he says, but she said she would be faithful. Or a 13-year-old boy, dad said he wasn't ever going to drink again. A small business owner, they promised that they would pay this bill and now I have nothing left to pay my employees. What in the world am I going to do? I probably don't have to remind you because it's happened to you as well, hasn't it? And as you look back at probably in your life, there have been these situations, these circumstances that as you look in your life, the beginning of the breakdown in a relationship was when trust was broken, when dishonesty entered into a conversation or into your relationship. And the reality is there's a There's a big cost to dishonesty, isn't there? There's a financial cost. There's a relational cost. There's absolutely a spiritual cost to it. And I don't probably have to convince you much of this because you've experienced it for yourself. That's why God looks at us and his people and he says, I know that's the way the world is around us, but when it comes to you, my people, I want you to live a different way. 
And for those of you who've kind of said, man, sometimes the Bible is kind of confusing. This is one of the most straightforward passages you will ever hear. Look again at what it says in Colossians 3, 9. It just says this. Say it with me. Ready? Don't lie to each other. I wonder what God's word really means there. (laughs) It means don't lie to each other. Be honest with each other. Tell each other the, the truth. Yeah. Now, it's such a straightforward thing, and we know this, but lying gets things really, really messy in your life, doesn't it? Again, don't say it out loud, but think about a time where you've been dishonest with someone. Things got kind of messy in your life, and especially in your relationships, didn't it? Because now you've got to make an excuse for where you were that night, or you've got to hide the receipt, or even worse, you've got to call your friends and say, hey, you've got to vouch for me. If so-and-so calls, you got to tell them that I was with you. And next thing you know, you've got a whole group of people and you're trying to follow up on this lie and on this lie and on this lie. And what you discover is lies take bigger lies to stay hidden, don't they? And there's something that breaks down in our relationships, something that happens in these moments where God, through his word, says, because of the mess, because of the damage that it does, don't lie to each other. Be people of integrity, be people of honesty, be people of trust in your life and the way that you interact with other people. And most of us know this because as we look back, it's not our intent to be dishonest. It sometimes just kind of seeps into it and we find ourselves just acting acting with dishonesty when we know better, we should do better. And this is why I love so much what God's word says to us. It says this, it doesn't just tell us what not to do. It actually tells us what to do next. It's not just, hey, don't do this stuff. God's word actually invites us to do something different. It says this, not just don't lie to each other. Look at verse 10. Put on your what? Your new nature. Audience participation time, my friends. Take a second and look at your amazing outfit that you wore today, all right? You guys are looking good, okay? Very handsome, very beautiful. For those of you joining us online, even if you're rocking your PJs, well done, okay? Isn't it interesting, my friends, that none of you woke up today and just said, how'd that get there, right? That you had to select what it is that you were going to wear today. Or if you're wise, you let your spouse select it for you. And all the men said, amen. Sorry, guys. There's only so much I can do to help you. All right? But it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That you had to be intentional about this. That you had to choose to put this on. That it was a choice. You had other choices that you could make. But when it came down to it, you had to put on these clothes that you have on here today. In a very similar way, God, through his word, says, when it comes to these fork-in-the-road moments... You've got a choice that you can make. You can choose to embrace that old nature, those things that God saved you from. And earlier in verse 8, Colossians 3, 8, it talks about them. Malicious behavior, dirty language, slander, anger, and rage. I mean, that's a road that many of you wouldn't want to go down. Many of you would look at your relationships and say, you know what I need more than my relationship? Rage. I need more malicious behavior. I I need more dirty language. No, not many of us are looking at that and saying, that's exactly what my relationship needs. That would bring healing to my life. But isn't it interesting that God's word says, in that moment, you have a choice in which to do. Don't put on that old sinful nature. Instead, put on your, your new nature. It's a choice that we can make That when those times come where we have a choice to choose to be dishonest or choose to live lives of honesty and integrity, God says, why don't choose that road, that road of who I've called you to be, of what I've saved you from? Now, it's usually in this point of the message that people look at me and they say, Pastor, I love you, but you're so naive Um, because you don't live in my world and you don't know that sometimes lies are necessary. And pastor, if you just worked with my boss, if you were in my spot, if you were married to my spouse, if you had my kids, if you had my dad or stepdad, if you dealt with my neighbors, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you you gotta lie. And oftentimes people will come up to me and they'll use an example, a a fun little story. And and just, I thought about one that I could share that hasn't actually been used, but I felt like it was fun and not too terribly offensive. So I'm going to share it with you anyways. Someone will come up to me and say, but pastor Keith, what about my sweet little Mima? You know, Mima's 90 years old, and every week I go over to sweet little Mima's house, and she makes her famous tuna nuda, lima bean, Velveeta cheese casserole, and she serves it to me, and she looks at me, and she says, isn't this delicious? And what she doesn't know is I throw up every night, and she feeds that to me, and it is a terrible thing, and it's horrible, but she looks me in the eyes, Pastor Keith, are you sitting here looking at me and telling me I have to lie to my sweet Mima? 
Are you telling me that I have to be this? What if she has a heart attack, Pastor Keith, because she's so shocked? Why are you so anti Mima, Pastor Keith? Why are you so mean to Mimas? Are you anti Mima? And I just want to say, no, 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 I'm not anti Mima, but I'm also pro truth. There's a way to be honest and filled with integrity at the same time of really navigating these situations. And it brought me to a passage that is some that I've seen before, but I never really thought about it until I was preparing for this message. Proverbs 3 3, and I think it is so fitting for what we're going to talk about today. I wanted to show you this, this passage from Proverbs 3 3 here. It says, Do not let, say it with me, kindness and truth leave you. Don't let Kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Not like an iPad tablet, but like a tablet tablet. A tablet of your heart. Don't let what do those first two things underlined say? Kindness and what? Truth. Kindness and truth. Two really important words that we have to understand when it comes to this passage. God's word says two very important things. Number one, absolutely speak truth. Absolutely, you've got to speak truth. And number two, do it with? Do it with kindness. A lot of times you'll hear us utter this phrase, Ephesians 4.15. You get a chance to read it later. It says, speaking the truth in, in love. This idea that when you speak truth, you always want to make sure that you speak it in love. Never have one without the other. And in much the same way, we come back to this and we realize we need to be people of honesty and integrity. And at the same time, we also need to speak it kindly. So I'd look back to the sweet Mima conversation and I would say something like this. Mima, I love you so much. I'm so thankful that I've got a Mima like you in my life. And Mima, I gotta be honest with you. Velveeta cheese, I think I'm allergic to it. I might be lactose intolerant, Mima. I'm telling you right now. But Mima, I need to tell you right now that even though that's not my favorite, you are my favorite. And I'm so thankful to all the love, all the care, all that you pour into this. How could I ever be more blessed to have a Mima just like you? My friends, that's truth and it's kindness. And I think sometimes we're not careful. We kind of come to these spots and we look for loopholes. <laughs> We look for reasons why we don't have to necessarily follow what God calls us to do as though somehow God hadn't thought through fully the ramifications. As though God looks at us and says, I'm sure dishonesty and breaking of trust will be fine in this part of your relationship. But each and every one of us would look back and we say, if you've ever been lied to and you find out about a little bit later, you're not usually going to that spot of, eh, no big deal. It's usually those moments, why didn't you trust me? Why couldn't you be honest with me? And why would you hide it for so long? And you've heard me say this before, but let me say it again. The cost of concealment is always greater than the cost of confession. The longer you wait, the harder those conversations become. And we've seen people in these experiences before, haven't we? Remember those people who thought they were going to get away with stuff forever? I didn't take any steroids. I've never taken steroids. Next thing you know, they've been taking steroids, right? Or you find these people who got away with some really malicious behavior, the Harvey Weinsteins of this world, and for years they tried to cover it up, and it was so much worse than if they would have confessed it at the very beginning and stopped harming all of those lives. The cost of concealment is always greater than the cost of confession. And so in this moment, God looks to us in his word and he says, no, 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 when it comes to that moment in the road, sometimes we look at, well, how can I be a little dishonest and maybe God will just be okay with it? What if instead when we came to those fork in the road moments, we asked a different question? How can I be a person of integrity and truth in these times? How can I find a way to be truthful and honest in a way that improves, in a way that helps us grow and build trust with one another? I was thinking about this a lot in my life and in my ministry. I've been pastor now for 23 years. And part of what I do as a pastor is you spend a lot of time with people at the end of their life Spent a lot of time by a lot of people at their bedsides. I've lost track of how many funerals and memorial services I've done to this spot, but I've yet to have a person when I'm waiting with them before they take their final breaths on this earth and get ready to go be, hopefully with Jesus in all of eternity, for them to look back at me and said, man, I just wish I would have cut a few more corners. I wish I would have told people a few more lies. I wish I could have manipulated people a little bit more, a few more half-truths, a few more fabrications. As a matter of fact, sometimes, even in those moments, some of the hardest conversations for me have been after those people pass away and people find out some secrets about them, some untruth, some dishonesty in their lives. And the devastation that produces for the family is, is pretty dynamic. And unfortunately, that's sometimes the reality in which we seek when we choose to live lives of dishonesty rather than honesty and integrity and truth. But at the same time, I've been privileged to lead some services over some truly incredible people of honesty and integrity 
my grandfather-in-law and my father-in-law being two of them, and literally seeing these people who even though things were so hard and even though it would have been an easier road and no one would have known any better if they just told a little white lie and who's going to know and what damage is it going to do, even though that seemed like the easier thing at the time, they chose instead to take that road that says, I'm going to put on my new nature. Choose to be who Christ calls me to be. And people of honesty and integrity and in those types of services to have people come up and say, the thing I love most about them was their honesty, their integrity. They took a stand when it wasn't easy. They were the kind of person I knew I could believe in, that what they said they would do, they would actually do. And those are the types of people that their relationships were solid because you know why? Trust wasn't broken. People knew the type of life that they were living because Jesus shined through them. My friends, if you ever needed a greater motivation for a life of honesty, a life of integrity, a life of truth and of trust, I want to remind you of what the end of the passage says, if we will do this, if we will embrace our new nature, if we will be those people that Jesus calls us to be, people of honesty, integrity, I want you to see what the result is. Here it is, Colossians 3.10, as you learn to know your creator and say these last three words with me, ready? Become like God. You become more like Jesus, more love, more grace, more hope, more peace. And as I joked a little bit earlier, some of those things we see in Colossians 3, 8, malicious uh, behavior, dirty language, the things that no one wants in their relationship. Anyone want to agree with me that sometimes we just need a lot more Jesus in our relationships? (laughs) More truth, more grace, more love, more peace. That's the result of when we live and choose to embrace a life of honesty and integrity, even though it's not easy. So what does this mean for you? As you look at your relationships and you come to those fork in the road moments and you've got a choice to make, instead of looking for loopholes, instead of looking for ways out, instead of looking for ways of how close can I get to this lie without actually lying? What if instead we asked a different question that said, Lord Jesus, how can I pursue truth and honesty and integrity? How can I put on my new nature and in so doing become more like you? I want to invite you to stand and I invite the praise team to come up today. We're going to close with a song in just a minute and it's a great song, Christ Be Magnified in Me and I think it's a perfect fitting song for what we're going to talk about today. But I also, if you're anything like me, I need a reminder of this. So today I want to provide something for you because it's easy for us to talk about it now and even in our minds say, yeah, this is going to be a great thing. I'm really going to do this, but I need this help not just on the weekends. I need it on Monday morning (laughs) when I see that neighbor or I talk to my spouse or my kids come back into town or when that really annoying coworker stops by. And so today we're actually going to give you an opportunity when you walk outside of these doors. And for those of you joining us online, I'm going to invite you to let us know in the comment section. We'll actually take care of one of these for you. But you're actually going to be invited to grab one of these little stickers with this verse on it. And it says, put on your new nature. And my invitation is maybe to do that very thing. Maybe as a reminder of what we've been talking about, that you could leave it where it is or you could actually put that on. Maybe on your Bible, in the cover of your Bible. Maybe on some place where you need a reminder of honesty and the importance of it. Maybe that place where you're tempted to be the most dishonest at your workplace. Maybe over the speedometer of your car. Just kidding. In those moments and times, what would it look like to be intentional? Hey, you're going to put something on. What would it look like if we put on that new nature that Christ has called us to be a part of so that we can grow and become more like Him? I pray that you'll do that today and that Christ would be magnified in our lives, that people look at you and believe, I can trust that person. And as Christ works through you in those moments, say, Jesus, I need you. Would you be that presence in me, giving me the strength to do that which you've called for me to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? I just want to pray over you today. Lord, we live in such a dishonest world. There's so many times and places where maybe we were even thinking about that, but I just want to focus on ourselves for a moment. Lord, it's so easy for us to take a shortcut, to find a loophole, but in the midst of it all, you've called us to live a different way, to to call us to be people of integrity and of truth. And Lord Jesus, we know it's not always easy. We get conversations with mimas and grandmas and grandpas and coworkers and kids. And Lord, we can't do it on our own, but as you are working in us, as you are working through us, 
that we trust and believe that you are present in this place and that you will give us the strength to do that which you've called us to do. And Lord, the greatest motivation of all is that he said so that we can become like him, become like you, Jesus. And what could be greater for people to look at us and not see us, but to see you shining through us, Jesus. Lord, help us to live out that call that you've given us, never to let truth and kindness leave us. We can't do it on our own, but with you, all things are possible. And we put on our new nature and become more like you, Jesus. We believe you for it all. We ask it in your name. And everybody together said, amen and amen.